Ah, God bless you. Oh, and I mean that. I don't mean, I'm, that's not a saying with me. I mean Elohim. You know, God creator, Elohim. And yes, that is the plural of El. Because, not because man who made rules of diction, how, it, because God who is multidimensional, you know that. It's, it, I'm a theologian, but that's not a, even a theological thing. You know that he's faithful, he's merciful, he's good, he's kind. You know that he has, he's multidimensional in his character and in anything else that you can think concerning him. And that's whether you think right or think wrong. Elohim is plural of El because God is. God the creator that I'm talking about is multidimensional. And in Genesis 1, when he gave the revelation of himself and his names or titles, whichever way you want to look at it, he started out in the beginning, which I share with you over and over and over, in the beginning reveals, before he even said Elohim, time, order, place, position, purpose. Five aspects that he is letting us know ahead of time that he, as creator, before he even does the creating for us to recognize him as creator, he's let us know some things about him. Time, order, place, position, purpose. Okay? Now, I'm go I'm, today we're going to talk about seed. And I'm going to bring it to you as the theologian that I am. And by the way, I'm Reverend Dr. K.E. Holmes. Okay, most uh, okay. You, you're a person of excellence. I, I share that with you. Like to share it with you, and I I will always want to share it with you because of what's in Genesis one. You, and I'm going to go to the Gospels right now of what I'm going to say. But remember how Jesus said, "I only do what I see, saw the Father do. I only say what I heard the Father say." I want to let you know that in Genesis. God starts out letting us know about saying so that when we see it over in uh, the faith chapter, when we see it in Hebrews 11, that through faith we understand, not through brainiac. And I'm a brainiac, okay? I'll let you know that. I am. I, I, I'll study a thing to the hilt till there's nothing else. And then I never believe that there's nothing else because something else always comes up because I have learned in studying that man always brings up a something else. And uh, God, in revealing himself before he, he lets us know God said, God said, God said. And right now I have a chart for this because I teach the names of God. Right now I'm, I'm doing coloring books for the names of God that I, I, I want you to order. As a matter of fact, right now, I, I, I need uh, 310 people to send me $1. I don't want anybody to go broke on anything. I'm going to talk about seed, and there's a whole lot about, about seed and a whole lot of preachers and prophets like to talk about. If you send me this, God's going to do that. Those things are true in the word and of God. But right now, I'm letting you know that I need... Actually, day before yesterday, uh, three hundred and ten dollars, and had had it, and then all of a sudden, for something happened, and all of a sudden, it's not there. So, if uh, three hundred and ten people send me one dollar today, and and I do want to let you know, uh, a principle in the world. The Hershey, Hershey Kisses, when it was one cent, went to over a million, I think over a billion. I, 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 I didn't know I was going to talk about it today. I would have looked it up. That's when it was just a one cent Tootsie Roll. So there's blessing. Most of us don't realize the blessing in sowing seed because the truism of it has been shared in ways that are incorrect, even even of people meaning well, not just of people wanting to to uh, make some money 
or or up their offerings because they need it. So many times we preachers think because we need it, that's what gives us the right to require it from you. Well, no, it doesn't. It is God who gives the increase. As a matter of fact, I have a website, uh, a cash generating website, uh, ptgwealth.com. If you want to go there and you need to give yourself an hour there to uh, watch all seven videos as to what the cash generating program is about. However, that PTG is from Genesis, uh, pardon me, not Genesis, Deuteronomy 28. I mean, pardon me, uh, Deuteronomy 8, 18, where God says, remember. And when God says, remember, that's what he means. Remember, not just quote it, but remember, not just tell him what to do, but we remember it is the Lord, your God that giveth thee the power, PTG, power to get wealth. That's why my website is ptgwealth.com. Because that that particular program causes humongous uh, cash to come to you in ways that are honest, ethical, and legal. Although I had a, a, a pastor look at the program and declare to me that it was not according to the word. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I turned this off and turned it down. Uh, and 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 I realized part of what I want to give us today about seed, our relationship with one another has a lot to do with how things go in our lives. And I knew that this person is someone I love dearly and I thought loves me dearly and would know that I'm not going to do stuff outside the word. And, and I, you know, however, they came back at me with, with that's what they thought about it. And I thought, ooh, ooh, what, what? And I realized I don't need to think about it. I need to go before God about it because my thoughts on it can cause ill in the relationship since I told her to look told the person to look at the program and they came back with thinking that it's all outside the word and I took it that how how in the world would you think I would do something outside of the word and one of the things that God is always letting me know and I'm reminding myself all the time when we read the word of God and we concentrate on the people of God, it's the people of God that are so often in idolatry. We expect the heathen to be in idolatry. And a lot of times they're not as bad off as we think in term. I mean, they're lost. Yes. Salvation wise. Yes. However, We don't tend to recognize when we're wrong. And one example that I'll give you, because we mean well, we think all is well, (laughs) that doesn't make it right, that doesn't make it well. God is the one who told us in his word that your thoughts aren't my thoughts. You know, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. Look it up because I might have said it backwards. However, in what I call churchianity, we often make it that that makes all of our thoughts sinful. All of our thoughts are wrong. Not necessarily. When they are, they are. However, there are times when our thoughts are just that, thoughts, and they're not God's thought. Just before the broadcast came on, I, w- I was saying something about the storms in the United States of America, where I live, and the hurricanes. And most of us recognize, most of us who are adults, and even almost adults, and and those of us who have been grown for a long time, adults for a very long time, we recognize that the seasons are out of order, and weather patterns are very different, and... uh, 
What do we know in God's word about it? To me, as a theologian, that doesn't mean it should be that way to you. However, for me as a theologian, I know in God's word, if you look up storm and look up all the different on storm, all the different scriptures on storm or fierce wind or wind and then look for rushing wind and all of that. And you get to see God's pattern, not just ideology, whether it's Western ideology, whether it's Eastern ideology, you get to see God's way and God's pattern. And by the way, for what we already understand, when we read a thing, we tend to take it according to the, what we already understand, the way that we have been taught to think. And I was trained as an educator. And uh, I'm going to tell myself, although I, I always say don't, I'm, I disliked it very much not, because I love education. However, I saw that the way that education was, I, I will say is, but was at the time, was that we tell you something, we want you to know that, and we want you to regurgitate that. And for me, education is to know, to learn, and to understand. And back in those days, I thought know and understand truth and facts. Now I've come to know and understand that because where man is concerned, facts change. Not just because of lies. There's plenty of lies, plenty of lies, plenty of lies. However, but because of Systems and times change. Right now I can say that it is sunny outside. But that's a fact that is true that can change. And it makes it different what I see. It makes a difference what you see. So, for us to make it that Anything, just because God let us know that my thoughts aren't your thoughts and your thoughts aren't my thoughts, it doesn't make any human thought wrong, even though God is the one who let us know, pardon me, there's something in my eye, but God is the one who let us know way back in Genesis that the heart of man, and that word is, is mankind, it's, it's Adam, but it's with the doohickeys on the lettering, the heart of man is only evil continually, and There's some things early in Genesis to make us know that. Uh, One of them, if I turn to it, I'm going to stop and do a word study on it. And I want to do this thing about seed today. And so I want to look up first mention of seed and first mention of sow. So I want to look at Genesis 47 and I want to look at Genesis 1. So I'm not going to turn to Genesis 1 right now to tell you this thing about (laughs) that I was going to just tell you a minute ago. Uh, I want us to understand that when God lets us know a thing, first mention has to do with the first time something is mentioned in his word, that is the nucleus of the thing. That is the core of the thing that is there every time you see it in the word, even when God is teaching us more about it or teaching us more around it or teaching us more of an aspect of it or the it or it in a circumstance and situation. And I'll give you an example that you won't stumble over right now. You can know Jesus as your savior And I pray that you do. And if not, stop right now and ask him to be Lord of your life. Repent of your sin and ask him to wash you in his blood and cleanse you by his blood. Ask him to be Lord of your life and ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And I'm talking about the spirit that baptizes you into the body of Christ so that we would become brother and sister or sister and sister. And so that... Uh, You are birthed into the kingdom of God and into the family of God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And 
I say Holy Spirit because I want you to know that that's the one who raised up Jesus from the dead. So he raises you with that kind of power. Jesus raised with victory and triumph, which, by the way, are two different aspects of the same thing. And maybe that's the wrong way to say it, but they're two different things. Victory, yeah, you've overcome, you're an overcomer. But when you read the faith chapter, some overcame right away, you know, like the mouth of the lion, and some overcame in the death that the lion ate them, that they were, they were crucified, that they were killed. That's the end of the faith chapter. It's still faith when you can move in faith. And how do you know when you're going through that bad, that strong, and that long, that when you don't have what you know, See, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. What you think is victory. And the victory is in your dying. Because maybe we don't do enough on the scripture that says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and love not their life unto the death. Oh, usually when I hear we preachers, I'm including me because I'm, I'm, I'm reminding me the Lord reminds me that what you see that's right and what you see that's wrong, look at yourself. It's not always they, them. And even when it is they, them, it doesn't mean that it's not you too. And that's talking about the, the right, the righteousness, the wrong, and the wrongness. And those are four different aspects. I hope I don't go into each of them today. However, what I was going to... I am going to turn to Genesis. Lord, help me not to get stuck on it because I really want to get to seed. But I was going to show you something the, um, about men. Okay, let me go to it in my computer. I mean, on my... Man. Genesis 1. Actually, it's not Genesis 1. Let's me know that I need to tell it to you because if I go into it, I'm going to do a word study on it and not get to seed and sowing. When, when Cain killed Abel, he, he, he said to God, what to me is a smart aleck, like how dare you say, am I my brother's keeper, you know? And um, however, the judgment, he said that it's more than I can bear. And he said... And, and you go look it up. I'm, I'm not looking it up now because I know I'll, I'll do the whole rest of the show on it. And I, won't get, I want to get to seed and sowing. And maybe I can come back to that if I give enough time or leave enough time. However, what he said was, uh, the, 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 the punishment is too much. And anywhere I go, uh, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna kill me. And, and when you go back and read that, you, in the wording, there's something that we learn way later in the scriptures, way later. I mean, we learn it in the Pentateuch and also in the prophets. However, we learn that anywhere he went, people would kill him. And it's from the aspect that he, oh, he, he, it would be justice to kill him because he killed someone. And even more so because he killed his own brother. Well, where did that idea come from? And most of us of churchianity, we like to think that when, the, when Cain and Abel, there was just Cain and Abel. There was just, you know, because we, we don't see that there's a whole civilization that went on. And in this, I want to pause and remind you and look this one up too. How the word of God is quick. It's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and all what it's profitable for. Because I want you to understand, and I, I do explain this a lot, that God's word doesn't give the details of every circumstance and situation that it refers to. It gives it as God's word, the parts that are alive and powerful and profitable for those things that that scripture says. And I'm talking about the scripture that says that his word is, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. 
so that all the history connected to something that the word refers to is not word. It doesn't mean it isn't true. It does mean that it may or may not be in truth. So, whatever happened in civilization, it can be recorded somewhere, and probably it is, because men did record. And we may or may not find it, kind of like the Book of Enoch, you know, we know that he wrote one, and then there's all these phony ones. But his, his, his book is still alive. So maybe we'll find it. The thing of it is, if we find it in our day right now, we're going to think this, that, and the other. Right now, when I watch documentaries, I, I like to watch documentaries. However, I like to not watch documentaries because they upset me very much because of the things that have been assumed about civilizations and so-called prehistoric civilizations and stuff that are just not true. They're not true according to the Word of God. However, in the Enlightenment period where different things were discovered, and for those of you who don't know, the Enlightenment period was a period of time where people didn't believe that the Word of God was literal, that the Word of God is actually true, and that the things that it tells about actually happened but they're allegories, and and intelligent people could know that. And um, I remember when I was a young when I was young in school, and this changed from element my elementary school days to my uh, middle what's called middle school. I call it junior high school days. That changed the ideology and the thought and the teaching and what was in the encyclopedias changed in this period. However, uh, the in the Enlightenment period. Uh, we we said that different things in the Bible couldn't have happened that way. And you know, with what we know today, that it couldn't have happened that way, like the sun stood still in Josh- for Joshua, uh, because then the law of gravity would have been interrupted and everything would have fallen off the earth. And then that's what elementary school, in my day, my time, elementary school, Uh, said that from the Enlightenment period. The only thing is, by the time I got to junior high school, we learned some things about gravity and the sun that we realized that, oh, yeah, it very well could have happened that way. And even dealing with my time, my time that I am living in right now, no matter when you're looking at this, if Jesus doesn't come and you're looking at it in a hundred years or a thousand years from now, in the time that I am living in and making this broadcast... In my time, we learned the word tsunami, and the tsunami that made us know that word and what a tsunami is, whether we got a correct understanding, that particular tsunami moved the earth faults that, here again, that I learned in school, that earthquakes can happen here and can happen here, and and the cracks in the earth are here and there, the earth faults were disturbed and moved, and it caused, and I'm going to say about approximately a half an hour to be removed from our time, or sped up our time a half an hour. Now that reminds me, I'm a theologian, so it may not remind you of this, how that God has let us know that the end time days would be shortened or the very elect would be deceived. Now there's a whole lot there. Oh God, Jesus help me. There is a whole lot in that phrase. However, when we learned that tsunami did that, I understood and, and in school we had learned that like the big earthquake would happen in California, probably wouldn't happen in New York. Well, that tsunami moved that fault line so that, yeah, yes, it could. And just uh, a, a few months ago, I'm sitting in a bank, and we all felt this earthquake. And here, I'm in Pennsylvania. The earthquake was in New Jersey, and then a, a part of New Jersey that's not real. Uh, and 
And we felt the earthquake like it was happening. We saw the wind shaking. We saw the trees shaking outside. Most of us didn't think it was an earthquake because we uh, still have the mind that an earthquake won't happen on this part of the, the United States, okay? So that we're not even prepared. And because the bank where I was, we're near the airport, and most of us there afterwards, you know, we're, we were sharing this, thought it was some, an airplane or something like that because it shook the building. And and everybody, you imagine in a bank, we're sitting different directions and there's uh, windows all around so that everybody's seeing differently from outside. So one side is seeing the shopping center that it's in and that's shaking over there. Another side is seeing the, the trees that are across and those are shaking. Hi, and then then... Like, I noticed that the windows were shaking and then could feel that my chair that I'm sitting in is shaking and the way that I'm, I lean on the, on the desk here, the desk was shaking. And I'm taking too long to explain this. So I want us to understand that the times that we are living in change our understanding of the very things we know and that we think we know. And that's part of why we want to stay in God's word about everything, anything, and all things. So that our understanding is enlightened, expanded, according to, and there I want to leave it at, according to, God knows how to get through to you. God knows how to get through to me. The way I think is different from the way you think. The way I understand is different than the way you understand. I'll give you an easy example. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And for the things, I've been living the stuff that, that makes me let you know that I need, and I mean absolutely need, 300 people, 310 people, to send me a dollar, Today, the craziness that has gone on, the craziness that has gone on, the times that we live in are affecting our thinking, our heart. And that's that's one of the reasons why my thoughts aren't your thoughts, God says. His thoughts aren't changed according to the weather. His thoughts aren't changed according to radio waves in the air. By the time most of us find out that the stuff that's been going on with our phones and our computers, our thinking and our health, catching a cold that's not a cold, and having coming out of a, a um, pandemic, you know, that, oh, well, it's not, it's not the that. Huh. However, it's like that. By the time we understand that it's the things in the air, and then the first of us to understand it will probably think in terms of the prince of the power of the air, instead of realizing that the only power he has is still under Elohim, under Yahweh Elohim, under Pardon me, I skipped, I went to first name of God, and I skipped to the third name of God. However, God interrupted himself to give us the revelation of the second name of God, Ruach Elohim. So I'm going to bring us to, I'm going to, I'm going to start with, with, I, I don't want to confuse us. I want to bring us into understanding. I said all that to help us understand that we are going to understand from different aspects. We are going to understand from different revelation. And do we know the difference from learning and revelation? And do we know the difference between knowledge of the world and knowledge of God? And do we even weigh in on these things? For example, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And then when you go to Ecclesiastes, uh, he tells us that, um, actually, I was going to say knowledge is profitable to direct, but I think it says wisdom 
is profitable to direct. I was about to misquote it. Here again, I say, look it up. And part of why I say, look it up, that's something God taught me when I first got saved. That when you hear the preacher preach and look up every verse that they're talking about. And what, and, and now I recognize, because back then they would give every reference, and I would look it up, but I would look up the, even the ones that they referred to. And I do have it in my notes, and I left them all home today, what I was going to talk about today. And it wasn't seed sowing. What we understand, we have come out of an era of time that we have been made to believe a piece of truth about something, and that is the blessing of seed sown. So like for some of you right away when you hear 310 people send a dollar, you some of you uh, are already insulted there's just asking for money, and others of you already know um, a blessing that you know send it, send it, send it, and then others of you are going to do it when you think about it, and others of you uh, you move in the 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 prompt to do it blessing, the cheerful giver is prompt to do it, and there's a blessing on the promptness, so that all of that about seed and all of that about sowing, that part is about sowing. I didn't get to the seed yet that there's a a blessing that's different than the blessing on promptness. There's a a blessing on getting it done, and there is a blessing on promptness. And one doesn't override the other necessarily. You can be in for double, triple, quadruple, exponentiated blessing according to how you do it. I'm just letting you know that uh, in in, uh, the Cheerful Giver Scripture, in Corinthians, there is a promptness to giving that has a blessing to it. And uh, to, to refer to something, I am not a poor person. However, I have been hacked to the point that, that there's hardly anything in my accounts that used to have a, ton, a whole ton of, anyway. And um, some of you may remember the uh, it's not a parable, but when Jesus gave some parables and the young man said, well, what do I need to be saved? And, and Jesus let him know what he needed to do. You know, you, you obey this, you obey that, and you give to the poor. And he says, I've done all this from my youth up. And so what do I need yet? And Jesus said, well, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he was sad because he was wealthy and he had a lot. And one of the things, because I know the scripture and because I don't bind myself to new new covenant and throw away the old covenant, I remember how, and part of this for me would be because God had taught me way back in, in 1968 to read a chapter of Proverbs for the day of the month. And by the way, with that, he also taught me that His calendar isn't according to the Roman calendar that we do use. However, because it is not correct according to God, doesn't make it wrong in order to read a chapter of Proverbs every day and that particular chapter that has to do with the day and the month. Okay, so from that I knew that when Jesus tells this to the young young man who was wealthy, Sell everything you have and give to the poor. He didn't just say sell everything you have. And he did but he however he did say give to give it to the poor. And in Proverbs it says that he who lendeth to the poor giveth to the Lord, and he will repay. Now God is not going to be in debt to you. Because the word of God lets us know. That the the I'm, I want to say it right. The debtor is servant to the lender. God is not going to be in debt to us. He let us know he repays. And then somebody else who reads it the wrong. Pardon me. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Okay. So I want us to see this, and I'm almost afraid to give it here first. 
I'm going to do Genesis first, just because God gave Genesis first to give us the principle. I'm going to come back to, to Genesis 47, but I'm going to, and it's not Genesis 1. It might be. Let me check, because I brought it up. I brought it up uh, in blueletterbible.org. Yeah. Okay. Genesis 1.11. And, and when the and is in the language, when it is in the Greek, sometimes it's there because our language, the language it's translated into, puts it there to make the, the it flow, to make the English flow. However, and I tend to, I personally tend to study with the Hebrew and with the Greek so that I have learned this that I'm sharing with you that I need to put something in here so I don't lose my space. That uh, when the and is there, it is, and here again, for my time and my understanding, I'm going to explain it this way. It is like an iron connection, an iron chain connection. Like this is so and this is so, but it's connected like iron. And I'm saying iron because that's the strongest metal that we know right now. Well, depending on when you're looking at this, that might not be the strongest metal. However, that's how I, right now I'm explaining the word and when it's there. So this, what was I reading? 11, Genesis 1, 11. Yeah, because there's a bunch of ands in, in those verses. Things that are connected. And, 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 and God said, and God saw, and that's, I, I have charts to let you know the difference between God said, God saw, God said, God made, this is all in Genesis, God called, said, saw, made, called, that's four differences right there, and he went back to said. Okay, so going to 11, I have a names of God chart that shows you these things because Jesus said I only do what I saw the, see the Father do or saw the Father do I only say what I heard the Father say or hear the Father say and most of us don't make that much difference in the word when we're busy looking at the creator and creation and get the differences between in the beginning God time, order, place, position, purpose. Then he gives Elohim. Or, and I'm skipping some there, to get the difference between the earth was, that means already there have had to have been something that he's not naming now. And maybe he'll tell about it later. He actually does. However, you want to read this. And so we can miss the God said, God saw. Oh, I'm I'm because I'm going uh, verse to verse. I miss God divided. And here again, I I often remind you that the verse divisions. And here again, look this up. Chapter divisions are twelfth century, and verse divisions are sixteenth century. And for some reason, other 1800s are coming to my mind. But look it up, because the Word of God didn't start out. Genesis didn't start out dividing in, in, in the chapters, the Hebrew version, okay? So, because of the, the verse divisions that I'm looking at, and here again, remember, I'm giving you the example. The way we understand something can be according to how we learned something. And I learned my Bible with the verse and chapter divisions that are here. And because of that, I just now missed, I gave it to you and I gave it to you incorrectly, that God said, God saw, God said, God made. Because of the chapter divisions, I mean the the verse divisions, I miss that God said, God saw, God divided. God called. Now I'm trying not to to skip. God said. God made. 
Now, and I wasn't counting when I said it that way, okay? When I'm reading it without what I learned, the verse divisions. Okay? So I want to go to 11 so I can get on what I want to share with us today. And how much time did I spend already? Seed and sowing. Because we have more than a generation that has come to understand the blessing of sowing seed in a way that has true ism to it and a lot of error to it. And most of us don't know God's word on the matter. And that's rather good intention or bad intention, which does not determine righteousness. It may determine how God handles us on on it, but it doesn't determine whether I'm right or wrong or whether you're right or wrong. His way, your way, God's way is right and righteous. So, and God said, so that ironclad next to all of the other ands, not, not any of it is to go without what went before it. So that when we pull it out by itself, That's okay to understand. That's okay to examine. However, don't keep it connected when you understand. And that we tend to do. Okay, so. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed. And here, this next and is in italics to know that it's not part of part of the Hebrew. The fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Now, one of the things that I want to show you about seed is that seed, God already said, it's the earth is to bring forth. And he lets us know the context and the where from. Now, he's going to show us more later about seed and different aspects of seed. However, remember, first mention, the nucleus of it is what's always there, even when God shows us more about seed or even about earth bringing forth. Okay, so God said, let the earth, and he said, let. He said, let. That's different from command that absolutely do this. The let, there's a process to let. That's not all about let. That's just part of what I'm letting you know now because I want to move on. When God says let, there's a process. And the let, oh, Lord, help me, help me, help me. Let the earth bring forth. So the bringing forth is what is supposed to happen. And the how. Grass. What has grass got to do with seed? The first mention, here it is. The herb yielding seed. The fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Now, there's there's a whole bunch of principles right there that God applies to ideology, psychology, physiology, science, and all kinds of things. However, it's all right here. Whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Now, God's letting us know. The way that I told you this thing, that's how it is. That's how it is, okay? Now, I'm going to... I'm not going to try to connect the dots. I wasn't going to anyway, but now, especially because of the time. Well, I'm going to go to the next verse. And the earth brought forth grass. Remember he said grass? Herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed in itself after his kind And God saw that good. Now, for those of you trying to follow along in English, I'm skipping the words that were in italics and only giving that. 
God saw. And that that is to help us to understand that God seeing didn't make it good. God said, and that's what was good about it. However, he's teaching us how to assess or to assess. Now, I'm, I'm going to skip a whole lot of what God has taught by the time we get to Genesis 47 about seed. Because by this time we've learned that you can plant seed in the ground and we've learned that things bring forth fruit other than trees. Bushes bring forth fruit and so on and so forth. And is that correct? Because God, the first thing God said is trees. So did we do some things that br- brings forth that's not after its kind? Because God said after its kind. And we bring forth stuff that's not after its kind. I was looking at a documentary yesterday on carrots. And all my life, I don't, I'm going to say it this way. What I'm familiar with all my life is orange carrots. However, I remember as a little kid that I saw yellow carrots and I saw green carrots. And I remember seeing purple carrots. And I thought I must have seen that in a cartoon because I was a teeny weeny weeny little kid that I remember seeing. That I actually remember seeing made me think as a grown person, I must have been looking at a cartoon. Last night, I'm seeing on a documentary that absolutely it was a certain culture and a certain people that put the red carrots and the yellow carrots, not after their kind, mixed them together. And that's how we have orange carrots and all of us are familiar with orange carrots hello and this is what I'm saying about what we understand and the true of what we understand and we want to make it truth whether it's truth or not God's way is truth what God says is truth he knew what he made that carrots can be yellow okay okay Um, I don't want to take time with that So uh, 47, Genesis 47, then go back and know what then is talking about, because there's a whole lot of stuff that happened. Most of us don't realize that the Pharaoh of Joseph's time was a whole other culture that wasn't Egyptian, even though he was an Egyptian king. And that's part of why later there came a, 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 a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph because the culture of Egypt got a king again or a a pharaoh again who was of their culture however they had been defeated and the culture the pharaoh of this time with Joseph he wasn't even of the culture and and so he did things differently and he could see and understand remember how we understand and where we understand from and so Joseph came and told pharaoh and said My father, oh, I want to skip to the seed part. Ah, I'm going to read it from from here because time, I'm using up too much time. Ah. And let the earth bring, uh, go back to where it was, 4723, that's where I want to be. Then Joseph said unto the people, behold, I have brought unto bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. Now understanding that seed is something that's negotiable the way we do money. And what they were doing with that seed is negotiating their lives. And we don't get that in our time, the things we do with seed. We don't, for some reason or other, we don't recognize that when we take acres and acres and acres and sow seed on uh, scores of acres, I don't get it how we don't recognize that in a generation or two, poverty takes over in that people and in that land. When families are not irrigating, when families are not planting, when families are not owning, you you can go back and check it out. And maybe you'll see it differently than I have seen. However, when we do it that way, our seed and our sowing costs us our lives. Not just livelihood, 
our lives. So I want you to understand that you want to know from God when you sow that you're sowing not into just a good idea. You're sowing into a God idea. Like the rich young ruler. You know, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He knew the scripture so well that he did it all, all his life. However, he was sad and not glad because he wasn't remembering. So many times God says, remember. And there's so many scriptures God says, remember. And we quote that. We, church leaders, apostles, prophets, pastors, leaders, kingdom of God leaders, we quote leaving off the remember part. God means it when he says remember. Ah, oh, it is the Lord thy God that giveth thee power to get wealth according to his covenant. Okay. Seed time and harvest. Look at the word of God on it to understand it. What it brings, what it brings, and the circumstance and the timing of how and when it brings it so that you know the times that we're in right now oh yeah there's a whole lot going on and you people of excellence have everything to do with things going right however the serpent being subtle he's not he doesn't have you in sin he has you remembering and looking at the storm looking at the lack looking at the facts of the circumstance Instead of the fact of who God is, how God is, that God is, we need to remember him. Remember all the promises in him are yea, yes, and amen. He is the amen, by the way. All the promises in him. Remember that. Be glad that he gives you the answer. I'm I'm speaking the first verse of Psalm 143. Be glad. Circumstance is awful. Things that are coming against you and look like they're taking you down. And you're looking at it and you know that you're sane and you have good sense and you know what you're looking at. Look at Psalm 143 verse 1 and be glad not full of sorrow and dread and dreariness. Be anxious for nothing. Be glad that God hears you. And look at how he says it. He hears you in faithfulness. He hears you in his mercy. He hears you. And his hearing is a doing. What I like to call bringing resolution and resolution. Oh yes. Yeah, you can you can look at the storm and sink like Peter. Or like Peter, you can look at Jesus and walk on water. Knowing good and well you never walked on water before. Knowing good and well that that would that would that could be a really good thing right now. Yeah. Be glad. And know that he is the amen. The yes and amen? Uh, that's the, to the church of the Laodiceans I'm referring to. That he, he did this, that, and the other. And he said, thus saith the amen. Jesus is the amen. I know we learned so well that amen means so be it. However, when you look at the first 13 times of amen. Mentioned in the scripture, I told you the first mention. The first 13 times the word amen has to do with things that are cursed. That God brings his blessing. Be glad. Psalm 143. Be glad. It's not that the things aren't as bad as you see. The storm. It was a great storm. Scripture testifies it was a great storm. Jesus had rest in one storm that he was asleep in the back of the, in the bottom of the boat. Professionals didn't understand how in the world are you sleeping? When you remember him, who he is and how he is, you can sleep. It's 
instead of the stuff keeping you awake, worrying you. And I mean me too. Oh yes, I mean me too. Look at that Psalm 43 one. Pray it every day. Say it every day while you're going through. While you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Your health, your circumstance. Oh yes, be glad. Because of who he is. He is the Amen.